So aside from sickness, what are our other statutory rights to time off? When it comes to managing absence, we have to balance off the business need in terms of we need people to be at work. People's statutory rights to time off and sickness is in those statutory rights to time off. Be in that you get statutory sick pay, we can't just sack someone because they're sick. As I say, we are human, we will get sick. So sickness has to be there as a right to time off work. But there's also a number of others, and in terms of how we manage it, we need to ensure that we're accurately giving people the time off that they're entitled to and recording it. That's also going to help reduce sickness and help us to plan as well. So I'm going to run through kind of what the statutory rights to time off are. You can see the top ones there, antenatal um, appointments. So this is actually a paid right to time off. So you're entitled to paid time off to attend any appointments that are recommended to you as a result of your pregnancy, usually by your GP, by your midwife. Where possible, we would expect people to try and do this in their own time, but the reality is for most people, especially full-time workers, it's not gonna be possible for them to do it in their own time. So they are gonna be entitled to those time, that time off. We would also consider pregnancy-related sickness separately to other sickness. So if somebody's sickness is higher, as a result of their pregnancy, then we wouldn't put that through any kind of process of dealing with that, with that as excessive sickness because it is just for the, the period of their pregnancy. So do make sure that you're giving people that time off for antenatal appointments. Ideally, people will be sensible as far as they can with how they're booking them. Um, it's not always possible. Even when, I mean, I had my children over 10 years ago now and even then I didn't have a huge amount of control over when appointments could be booked. Sort of my midwife would be available sort of one morning or one afternoon a week. Um, the NHS has clearly changed an awful lot since then, so I don't know what it is what it is like now. So we have to be reasonable in terms of those expectations around people sort of trying to book them beginning of the day, end of the day, things like that. Not everybody can get those appointments. So fundamentally, people are entitled to be paid for any time off they need for antenatal appointments. You've then got maternity leave, which is 52 weeks of leave, uh, 39 weeks of tracked statutory maternity pay, and adoption matches uh, maternity, effectively. I have, have got a separate course on dealing with maternity because it is a big topic in itself, and everybody that's on the HR and on HR Managers course, you have got free access to that maternity course. So if you have got somebody who's pregnant or you want to store that course for when you do have somebody comes and tells you they're pregnant, so you know what to do at that time, you've got that available as well. So that's our, our maternity one. And say so adoption kind of mirrors maternity. Paternity is for the partner of the mother or the father of the uh, child and it's the right to two weeks of time off to um, in the first 56 week, 56 days sorry, um, following the birth of the child. It attracts statutory paternity pay and can either be taken as one week or two week. Can't be taken in odd days, it's either a week or two and if you only take one week then you lose your entitlement to your second week. Shared parental leave, very complex, take advice. We don't come across it very often. It doesn't get used very often, but this is effectively where the, the mother brings her maternity leave to an end sooner than the 52 weeks and then transfers the remainder of, of her leave into shared parental leave, which she then can share with her partner or the baby's father to um, to share out that that leave and there's a number there's a huge flexibility around the ways that they can share that leave the uptake on it though is so low that and, and it is quite complex we, we just don't come across it very often so I would say if you if you do get a request for shared parental leave it's worth taking specific advice um, and you'll probably find that your HR advisor that you're taking advice on has to go and look it up as well because they probably haven't de dealt with it for a little while, if ever, um, which is a shame. I, ha I will um, put my, my personal view in there. I think it, it is a shame. I can also see some reasons, um, particularly 
around recovery and, and things that maternity is about. So uh, it's, it's a complex one, um, but that's there, be aware of it. Accompanying a pregnant lady. Now this is the entitlement for up to two appointments for the partner or the baby's father to accompany a pregnant lady to up to two of her appointments. And I think it's up to six hours um, per appointment. I'll put some uh, extra details in um, into these, and as I say, this will be incorporated in the maternity course as well. And it's it's unpaid leave, but it does give you that right to to, to time off to attend those appointments. People generally use it for the scan appointments because um, that tends to be the one people want to accompany to. And then the uh, one that we come off across a little bit more often, although not all the time is parental leave. Parental leave is the entitlement to unpaid time off up to 18 weeks per child, of which four of those weeks can be taken in each individual year per child. So if you've got two children, you could take eight weeks in a single year. Has to be taken in blocks of a week unless the child is registered disabled, which is a different definition to the, the normal one we're using in employment under disability, um, under the Equality Act, sorry. The, if the child is registered disabled, then parental leave can be taken in odd days, but for everybody else, it's in blocks for a week, it's unpaid. And it's up to the child's 18th birthday, so it's a maximum of 18 weeks in total four in any one year, but obviously that's not four every year because that will go over the 18 week total. <clears throat> so, pregnant, so parental leave is generally used by parents wanting to cover school holidays. <clears throat> so a parent may say take two weeks of annual leave and four weeks of parental leave in the six weeks holiday to cover the full six weeks holiday. However, it's unpaid and therefore the uptake is not huge because if you're a parent and you're thinking about the six weeks holiday and the cost of the six weeks holiday, dropping four weeks pay is huge when you've also got the cost of the fact you've got children at home for six weeks. And I think that's why the uptake is so low. Um, but that's an opinion, that's not a legal fact. That is an opinion and um, parental leave is there though. So if you've got somebody coming to you and saying, I'm struggling to work out how I'm gonna deal with the school holidays, they have got the entitlement to parental leave. You can let them know that that statutory entitlement is there. And you should have all of this in your, in your employee handbook. You are required in your contract of employment to tell people about any paid time off they're entitled to. And obviously this is unpaid, but we would generally share this information in an employee handbook so people know what their entitlements are. But yeah, parental leave is there. Again, it's not used that often. But be aware of it because it may help out an employee and it may enable you to, to work with an employee to solve an issue that they've got around childcare. Then the next one is time off for dependence. Now time off for dependence is commonly used because it kind of has to be. <clears throat> like sickness, it's unpaid time off, uh, sorry, it's unplanned time off like sickness and it is also unpaid. So it doesn't attract statutory sick pay in the way that sickness does, it is unpaid. It's time off to deal with the unexpected incident. So that unexpected incident could be some could be a phone call from the school, and that is explicitly put into the legislation that that entitles you to time off for dependence. So if the school phones and says you've got to come and collect your child, then you are entitled to time off for dependence to deal with that. It could be the immediate, so you wake up and you find that your child's covered in spots, they've got chicken pox, and you're like, oh, I can't send them to school today, what am I gonna do? Time off for dependence whilst I deal with it and figure out the long-term childcare. So this is for unexpected incidents. It's not for anything that's regular, it's not for school holidays, it's not for sports days or anything that's planned, known about, it's for unexpected incidents which require us to be looking after a dependent. And that may not be a child, that may be an adult dependent. So it could be our partner, anyone that's living with us but is not a lodger or um, somebody who works for us. Any adult that is reasonably dependent on us at the time, 
Uh, and it does also include your dependent going into labor as well, that's specifically on there. Now often that's going to be the partner of the mother, but bear in mind, not all mothers going into labor have partners and therefore that could be the parent um, of the mother going into labor and um, may need to take time off for dependents because her their, chi their adult child who wouldn't normally be dependent on them may now be dependent on them because they've gone into labor. So it covers quite a range of things, that time off for dependents. So be aware, but make sure that you're recording this separate to sickness because it is separate. We cannot merge the two. Now, unfortunately, if we've got someone with really high sickness, we often find that the same person has high levels of time off for dependents as well. And there does come a point where we say, if you can keep having this time off, it's no longer an unexpected incident. And therefore that entitlement to time off you need to figure out another way. You need to figure out another way of managing the, the sort of situation with regards to your children or the adult that you're caring for. So it is a complex one. And again, I would suggest that you take advice. If you've got somebody you think is, is excessively using time off dependence, take advice because it is a statutory right. And do bear in mind what we've said in, I think I've said it in other se sections around the automatic unfair dismissal. So if we dismiss somebody because their sickness is excessive, we can do that um, because we can get to a point where the business cannot accommodate it. We can't dismiss somebody for asserting a statutory right. That's gonna be an automatic unfair dismissal if we simply dismiss someone for asserting a statutory right. So that's where this time off for dependence becomes a little bit challenging because at what point are we saying this is excessive this is no longer actually your statutory right and i think that's the point at which we're saying it this is no longer your statutory right to time off because it's not unexpected anymore so if you know that your child for example struggles with school and therefore the school are regularly going to be calling to for you to bring your child home from school it's not unexpected anymore it might be on that particular day but it's not unexpected and Therefore, you need to have an alternative arrangement planned in. Now, I, as, a, as a parent, I mean, that's, that is really hard to say, as a parent that has still dealt with some of these struggles, this isn't about attacking and blaming parents, and there's, there's a whole load of complexity around this as well. But from an employer point of view, we are managing the, we are managing a business, and we can't have people who just keep leaving the business. We've got to be managing the business. And that's where when you've got your performance expectations right, you can also manage it right. So if you've got a parent who's regularly being called out, but actually they're able to manage their time and their work, it's going to have less of an impact. Whereas, OK, let's go back to the hairdresser example. If you've got somebody who's regularly being called out at the last minute and that means you're letting clients down, then you've got a much greater problem. So it is about, we have to think about the business because ultimately if the business isn't viable, if it's not making a profit, if the impact of this individual impacts negatively the business, that's kind of everybody's jobs with a problem. So we do have to think of it on those lines. Public duties, which I hadn't mentioned, really rare that we come across this one, but do bear in mind that people have the right to unpaid time off for public duties, which includes things like being a school governor, um, hospitals, I think, police have similar sorts of duties that would fit in there in terms of public duties there is a statutory list of them and uh, most people volunteer for this outside of work and it and actually it brings a lot of benefits to people in work when they've got these volunteer roles occasionally we see that it might overlap in terms of what they're doing so a school governor for example may have to deal with a disciplinary issue in a school which would have to be done within the teacher's normal working time, which means that the normal school governor duties, which are done in perhaps an evening, which don't impact work, mean all of a sudden actually we do need the time off work to be able to do this duty. So that's why we've got public duties there. Jury service doesn't technically fall within that, but clearly if somebody's called for jury, jury service, it's there's a criminal law around that and we obviously would not want to stop somebody. We could, we can write and ask the courts to delay it, but if they don't agree to that, 
then we somebody has to go to jury service. So they're going to have to have the time off to be able to do that. So do make sure that when people are taking time off that you are recording the rights to time off accurately. That's absolutely crucial. Welcome to HR for non-HR managers. If you are a people manager, a business owner, or perhaps you work in HR and you're looking for a more practical application of employment law, then this course is absolutely for you. I'm gonna take you through every step of the things you need to know to build up the foundations to be able to manage your team really effectively and keep your business safe. I've devised this course in a way that takes you through each of the foundational pieces as you need them and puts together the building blocks that you need. Look forward to seeing you throughout the course and good luck.